this is the, the number one aspect I want to talk today about. It's managing aut autonomy and how we do this at Product Hunt. We don't mean like isolating, we don't mean don't become a team player or never work with other people, blah, blah, blah. This is not what we're trying to say. Uh, hi, my name is Andreas. Uh, first up, all the slides are online, so if you want to like skip or hat or read, like read a little bit faster than I talk, feel free to go to do so. Who here knows Product Hunt? Just a quick show of hands. Wow. Okay, shit, that's a lot of people. <laughs> so for those who don't know us, um, imagine Reddit and the App Store have an ugly baby. So <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's basically a community where you can launch a new product. So like think about like whatever you're currently trying to build and you want to show this to the world. This is one of those places where you want to launch, where you can like find early adopters, where you find like press, where you find investors, all these kind of things. I was the founding team member, CTO there, uh, moved because of this company, I moved to San Francisco. The full t the team is actually distributed, like we're pretty much everywhere. The headquarters in San Francisco, but as far as I know, currently nobody's actually working from San Francisco. It's just like still the San Francisco company, I guess. Most people know us because of the news feed, so like all the products of today, but like the more you go actually into the product, the more you go into the community, the more you actually discover different aspects of the product. It's a surprisingly big application by now, because I guess if you have enough funding, if you make enough money, you just continue building stuff, I don't know. But there's a lot of stuff to actually explore, there's a lot of stuff happening there. 2017, we sold to a company called AngelList, which is basically the LinkedIn for startups. It's a place where you can find investors, where you can find co-founders, or where you can find talent. I'm the head of remote there, and if you have no idea what the head of remote is, me neither. <laughs> it's a completely made up title. The idea behind it is that I basically lead um, all products endeavors that are somehow related to remote teams, remote work. And additionally, I have like an unofficial role which nobody gave me and nobody pays me for is to make sure that AngelList goes more and more remote. For those who don't know AngelList and why this could be interesting to you folks here is it's basically the biggest job board out there in my opinion for remote work. We have like 7,000 companies remote companies hiring right now, 1,000 of those are fully distributed and they are hiring right now. They have like job postings still live currently. We have 1 million and more candidates who say that they're looking for remote work. So if you're looking for a person who used to work at Google, now lives in Central Europe, has experience with Ruby and Rails and has been looking for a job in the last two weeks, there's a search engine for that. And additionally, we have a platform, like we have a team that helps people to hire like the top of the pyramid. So for example, like you need a VP of engineering or you need to, like this very few, very experienced people, that's A-list. Another thing is AngelList has a huge angle that's about investing. Uh, it's one of the uh, largest vehicles for investing in Silicon Valley. I'm running a small syndicate, which is a little bit non-public, but I'm happy to share this here. It's basically a group of people who are experienced with remote work who actively invest in early remote teams. So let's get started. Quick disclaimer, everything I'm going to say is my opinion and feel free to disagree. I hope you actually disagree. Everything that works for me might not work for you. I have experience with small to medium sized teams. I've never worked for Google. I will never work for Google and I have no idea how to scale to several thousand people. Many people here do, I don't talk to them. And a lot of things I'm going to mention, although it's called engineering management, it's applicable to any kind of team and it's also applicable to non-remote teams. So there is no special magic sauce here happening. So the goal of this talk, I want to talk a little bit about how managing remote teams is different. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, Product Hunt's approach to autonomy because I think it's, it's a very good one. And I want to talk about ownership and decision making, basically how to enable your team and get your people to actually pick and basically take ownership. Cool, so why remote work? And I'm preaching a little bit to the choir here. You guys are, I think you know this better than me, but remote work from my point of view at least is the logical evolution of digital work. Against all concerns, the internet is not going to go away. It's very unlikely that you're not going to work online in the future. It's very unlikely that we're not going to work with people in other countries in the future. It's very unlikely that we won't have international teams and just use the technology we have. Remote work is here to stay. Another thing is that, in my opinion, everybody's already working remote. So you might check your emails on your way to work. 
you might work Fridays from a coffee place, you might travel to a conference and work from there, but to some aspect you're already working remote. The only question now is like how much of your time you're actually working remote. My personal motivation is a little bit different. I got the opportunity to work with amazing international talent, people who if they would live in San Francisco work with, would easily work with for like the top end companies and would be like directors of engineering there. And I had the chance to work with those people in my team. Because of remote work, I also had the opportunity to have an international career. And it's kind of like one of my ambitions to make sure that a lot of international talent actually has this opportunity to work for jobs that actually deserves their talent. How is remote work actually different? Uh, from my point of view, remote teams have roughly 5x the process teams. If you're five people in an office, what you do to get a meeting is you literally shout around the corner and everybody rushes in and you have a meeting and you do whatever, everybody's excited and you cheer, you high five and then you whatever you do. That's how you work in a co-located team. In a remote team, if you're five people, you need to do crazy things. You might need to announce that you're going to have a meeting and plan that. You might need to leave notes because Pete couldn't join because Pete had to, like lives in a different time zone and he had to get his kids to school or something like that. You actually have to plan this kind of stuff. You have to install processes to manage like all the basics that at this scale, usually you wouldn't have in a co-located team. Uh, co-located teams usually get around a lot of really bad processes by monkey patching, which just means fixing on the fly, fixing their bad processes with more and more meetings. If something doesn't work, if people didn't get it, another meeting. If you have whatever problem, you do another meeting. In remote teams, this is something which we can't easily do because Meetings are expensive to remote teams, are exhausting to remote teams. Everybody who has been in a hangout call that's more than an hour knows how this feels, like this is draining energy at the end. Another thing is remote is really good for iteration, like for focus. You can optimize your whole day and all this kind of stuff. One of the big disadvantages about remote work is like you're losing a lot of nuance. Remote is better for iteration. Uh, uh, meeting in person is a little bit better for innovation. And what I mean with innovation is not being innov innovative. I mean having a huge pivot discussion, having like the quarterly planning, having like all this little nuanced uh, stuff where it's just easier to get a message across if you actually meet in person. So what's really, really hard about remote teams? Is it the processes? Is it cultural di differences? Is all of this kind of stuff? In my opinion, no. All of this kind of stuff is in a way s symptoms or solutions, but like the real problem that's really, really hard in remote teams is trust. The number one thing that a remote team actually needs to figure out is how to think about trust, how to manage trust. Because let's be honest, unless you install some, I don't know, tracking software, spy cams, I don't know, like hack their computers, or you are some sort of evil mastermind and to figure something else out, and in this case I shouldn't work for you and I think nobody wants to work for you, but like unless you manage to completely micromanage them for like monitoring, which you shouldn't do, you don't really know what they're doing. And this is not a random example. Like when Destiny 2 came out, I was really, really worried about some parts of my team. When Apex came out, I was like really like, oh, please, no, like, like, let, please, let this please be a flop, you know? This is a real concern as a manager in a remote team because you have to trust them in a way, right? Uh, another thing is it's really, really hard to get across motivation like, and, and, and just general emotions through video calls. Maybe that's just because I'm Germanic and like emotions in general, like a little bit what the fuck for me. But it's really, really hard to know if somebody's actually motivated or if they're just really, really good in faking half an hour once, uh, once a day to show you how motivated they are. And I know a lot of people who are really good in that. Getting people excited in a, in a hangout call, like I remember like we had like internal funding announcement and we were like, hey, awesome, yay. And then everybody cheered for like 10 seconds without forgetting like turning mute off, you know, like so everybody was like. <laughs> and yeah, that was awkward. Next time we were like, hey, what if everybody gets like a bottle of champagne and we open it together? Yeah, it works. <laughs> it's still very awkward and you kind of have to trust that people are actually really excited because you can't like just shout into a camera for all the time. It's weird. Another thing, I'm Germanic. I live in California. If you have ever met Californians, they're a little bit different. No offense. Like Californians will be like, do whatever you think is right, we fully trust you. And I'm like, sure, I do that. Uh, no, that doesn't work. Cultural differences. <laughs> You know, also apparently I give very direct feedback and I have a way to just express what I think, which is apparently borderline artistic in California. So <laughs> cultural differences are a real thing. Most important one for especially engineering teams is taking ownership. It's really, really hard to figure out 
uh, how to get people to get, uh, take ownership. And at that point, like, okay, now they're taking ownership and they're doing all the wrong choices. Like, a common problem, that's again trust and like how to establish decision making, especially with engineering teams. Everybody who had like worked with engineers, including me, at some point, they go down a rabbit hole, they start refactoring something, you lose like half a day before you notice, one day before you notice. All of a sudden, like you're halfway in and now you have to as well finish it because it's going to be only just two days. All of a sudden, the week is gone. Another thing is like when the team grows, and I think a few people uh, experienced this here as well, all of a sudden, you have more and more people joining the meetings. And you have like this one project where actually two people or three people work on, but for some reason, 10 people are involved. And you can't really figure out what happened, but that's just how things are done now. So all of this stuff, in a nutshell, if you root it back to the root cause, is trust and how to actually think about trust. And when I say trust, a common feedback is like, either you trust somebody or you don't. And or like you just have to blindly trust your team. All of that stuff is wrong. Like it's simply not wrong. Like this is not, this is simply wrong. Like this is not, not how we work. This is not how we can work. Trust isn't a binary thing. Like you trust different people differently about different things, and like in different points of time, you change your opinion about that, and you might trust them more or less about these kind of specific things. The other thing is like there's a common saying that trust is earned, which is kind of true. But when you quickly scale your company, you can't really wait for everybody to earn their trust before you actually let them do their task. You can't like hire an amazing head of product and be like, you do whatever you think is right, but make sure it's exactly what I would do. So you need to systemize trust. You need to think about all this kind of stuff. And when I say like systemizing trust, what I mean is like you need to uh, create and establish processes how you manage trust and how you verify that the trust, how you give trust, how you receive trust, all these kind of things. It's about actually understanding each other, getting to know each other, and like the differences in culture and all these kind of things. And the rest of it, like in the rest of the talk, I want to talk a little bit how we do that and like how you should do that, or like at least how I recommend doing that before I get into this. The most important aspect here is actually just to meet people. And this is not the topic of the talk. A lot of people will talk about this here. This is not the one thing I want to focus on. But like actually meeting the people is, in my opinion, always a game changer. When somebody joins a team the first time they actually meet the rest of the folks, that's a big game changer. I remember this is like the first time we met in, uh, in San Francisco. At that point, we were working together for several months. And I was like literally night and day talking to those people in Slack and working with those people. And I remember like when I first met, for example, Eric, I didn't know if I should shake hands, hug, fist bump, high five, kiss. Like I really didn't know what kind of relationship we had at this moment. But I know afterwards this changed and I understood him better and he understood me better. And all these little quirks that you noticed in Slack about people all of a sudden make sense. This is the number one game changer. It's absolutely worth the time. This is the, the number one aspect I want to talk today about. It's managing aut autonomy and how we do this at Product Hunt. We have a concept which we call internally single player mode or optimizing for single player experience. And the whole idea here is that People, if you hire well, by default are capable, they're fast, they're motivated, they want to get stuff done. They, they, they joined you and they, they, they worked hard to get this job and they actually now want to get things done. Unless they're blocked. And when they get blocked, they lose time. Like imagine you playing a computer game. Like imagine you're playing Mario, you're super motivated, first level, you press jump and now it's like, please wait for Frank. Frank will be online in three hours. <laughs> <laughs> Frank will get back to you and will let you know what you should do next or like, like will let you know if this is okay what you just did and whatever. I'm pretty sure Nintendo wouldn't be where they are if this would be the game. I Single player mode is about establishing clear goals so that people roughly know where to go. Uh, establishing um, a process or like an, a, an attitude of finding paths to get there. Uh, automate as much feedback as possible as much instant feedback as possible and enable people to level up on their own time, on their own pace. We don't mean like isolating, we don't mean don't become a team player or never work with other people, blah, blah, blah. This is not what we're trying to say. What we're trying to say is creating autonomy because autonomy is not abandoning people. It, the idea is to enable people that they can choose the route and that they can drive on their own speed and in their own way. So, step one, establishing what we call like find a path attitude. You don't have design yet, use the standard components, which also requires investment as a team. You need to actually build these standard components because it should, ideally you get to the point that you have like a rough mock-up by somebody and, that, and everybody in the team already knows how they should look like. You don't need to wait for designer, you just like move ahead. Product aspects unclear, 
you know how roughly how we make decisions by now. Make these decisions, get feedback later. The most important here one is my opinion is actually technical implementation. You get to the point where you have to build something as an engineer and you know like right now you don't have the time to actually do this and you want to as early as possible ship something at least to like a better audience or something like that and you have to basically figure out a way to do this. So now you can discuss how should we do this or you fake it. My favorite example is the recommendation engines of Product Hunt. So it's a uh, website where you launch a new product. And if you like this product, you might like these 10 other products as well. And this is almost like the core essence of what we do. So early on, I was, hey, we need a recommendation engine here. And I have to build one. And I don't have time to figure out how to do this with machine learning back then, and all this kind of stuff. So I will be smart about this. And I will just use a graph database where I do like a few complex queries, which I have to automate like all the data into, blah, 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 all this kind of stuff. I had a prototype in like one day, so I was actually, as an engineer, was like really proud. The output of it was okay. I was like, okay, one more week of tuning and this would be from okay to good. The problem is we didn't really have the time or capacity of this and it also like was fundamentally against how we work as a company because we, like, we always try to ship and push as early as possible. So what uh, the co-founder instead recommended, like Ryan instead recommended, is to simply add a form in the backend where you can add post IDs. What we did is we actually manually typed this in. I felt like super guilty about this. Like we had all of a sudden people in the team who had to do this every day. There's like 80 new products and now you have to go into the search like database and like figure out which other products could be a good fit and add them. You know, I felt like super guilty about this, but on the other hand, it worked. And I, as like the European engineer getting there, was like, really? <laughs> Is this what we do now? Okay, yeah, but the good thing, it worked and we were able to ship really fast. We found a path and we could like just avoid like all these obstacles and like ship quickly. The product and recommendation engine is two days still largely built around this because what we've realized later on is that this curation aspect is actually huge value. So what we did at some point is we actually opened up this to the community. We let the community suggest products so that our team just needs to like whitelist and like uh, confirm. We let other community members actually do the whitelisting process and so on and so on. So we actually managed to scale this with human labor really, really big. So anyway, uh, step two, investing in tooling and automated feedback. This is developer specific and I th might be similar stuff for other uh, uh, verticals, but like especially in engineering, there's a lot of best practices that you can fully automate. Linters and uh, other checking tools that basically ensure that people work according to whatever you define as best practice. You can have automatic testing and all this kind of stuff. So at some point, the developer knows if they are finished, like if no more tools are instantly telling him that her that she's doing something wrong, at this point, the code is at least good enough to be deployed, like it's finished. Another thing is what we use religiously is feature flags. It's very likely that if you build a product in our place that you will ship it almost like the next day, but you will only ship it to yourself publicly. And then you will only ship it to all the administrators and then you will only ship it to the better group and then you will ship it to like everybody or like whatever. The other aspect here is like whenever something breaks, there's an easy way to, for you go to go to just like revert everything, like fix this holy shit, what just happened, like let's get this back and fix it. All of this stuff can be done as a single player. None of this stuff should ever cause you problems. So, like you should be able to ship confidently. And if stuff really explodes, there's like tooling and everything in place to help you in this point. So processes is number three here. The, uh, with processes, what we focus on is processes that actually avoid back and forth. A good example is pull request reviews. Pull request reviews is essentially, I just wrote code, please give me feedback. The main idea here is, what we are trying to do is, every morning, everybody does this thing. Like everybody, every morning you get coffee before you do any other work, before you check emails, you feedback other people's work because you will unblock them. My goal here actually when I review your stuff is not to tell you where you're wrong or critique or how I would do it. I will actually just tell you how you can like do stuff in a way that you can ship it faster if I have an idea. Everything else should anyway be already automated. I don't expect you when I give you feedback to tell me what like, hey, I now changed this, this is not good enough, can I now ship it? This is not like a council of adults, uh, of like the old wise people telling you what to do. We give some feedback, you either like change the code or you tell me in a comment why you're wrong and you ship. We don't care, like I don't care, like I won't reapprove. Like I don't, we'll look again at it. Like you should just move ahead and you ship. Because I might not be online when you have done this change. Uh, another good aspect is like in the beginning we had like a lot of trouble with uh, tech debt. 
a lot of like old code getting, getting into the way. Anybody who has ever changed front-end frameworks or this kind of stuff knows there's just a lot of stuff you didn't get to actually clean up afterwards. So what we introduce is every Friday, unless your project is on fire, you can work on whatever you think is useful. And the idea here was like you've cleaned up whatever you think is currently useful. We have no pre-approved list for this. You as an engineer, you ask to figure out what you think is effective, what is useful. The good thing about it, it got us to the place that we don't have to do big refactoring projects as like normal planned projects anymore. So what we do is unless there is product value in normal planning, there is no refactoring happening because we have Fridays for that and that's fine. So if you have anything that pisses you off, use the next four Fridays and it will be gone. An important thing about processes in remote teams uh, is don't plan for like having a process that works with you when you're like 10, 20 people and will work with you with like 50 people. If you're growing, every six months you will change how you do processes in a company. So what I just recommend is like pick stuff that works for you right now, wait for new problems to pop up, and then fix those problems with new processes or with adapting your processes. Step number four, I think, is what most people here do anyway, is keeping everything in the public. Every documentation, every meeting needs to be shared because people won't ask. If I join a team and I be the new guy, I won't ask for all this kind of stuff because I'm embarrassed to ask this kind of stuff. So ideally, this stuff is already there and I can read it. The same is true with all the automation and feedback. The main reason why we have the automation and feedback is that you can learn on your own pace. And this is also like the other thing why I highly recommend this. It's not so much only the efficiency. It's not like that people are more effic effective and more faster and whatever. The other thing is just onboarding. Um, Radu, who took over the engineering team after I, like after we transitioned in Angelis and I took over like other roles, um, he introduced an onboarding plan where we expect people to demo a new pro, like a new feature in their first week. So basically, hello, welcome to the team. Here's a bunch of accounts. Here's a bunch of stuff you have never seen. Here's a code base you have no idea about. Next Monday, you demo, have fun. Next Monday, presenting to the whole team like I do here now. Hey, this is what I built, hi. You know, um, in a lot of companies, you don't even get to the point that you have anything running in the first week. You know, like how we see this is like if you're not able to do this, the team did something wrong. If you manage to break anything, we did something wrong. You shouldn't be in a point. You shouldn't be in a place where you can actually fuck anything up here. Also, it enables people to level up on their own pace. We had people who joined as juniors, um, for example, for iOS, and managed to join the web team really quickly later on. Uh, Rado told me he will never be a web developer, and now he's leading SEO at Product Hunt. I'm like, okay. <laughs> um, Raul, uh, he, he constantly sent us bug reports and we got him as an intern. Um, really quickly afterwards, he was leading one project which became one of the biggest money makers we have right now. It enables people to level up on their own time and it enables people to take ownership. And for good ownership, like being able to actually take ownership, decision making is a huge point. My opinion is a manager is not the person who decides for our people. A manager is not a full-time communication hub. You're not, your job is not to communicate what other people communicated. This is not what a manager does. As a manager, you manage processes and you lead people. You create processes and you facilitate with communication if these processes fail, you introduce new processes together with the team, or you help people actually grow and become the people they are, like mentoring them, coaching them, figuring out their career paths and all this kind of stuff. How do you, make, uh, how do you enable people to actually do the good decision making? And these are like if the next few slides, I'm going to skip a little bit, but you can read this, all of this like online. But the most important aspect here is to make people understand how you actually make decisions, how you as a company actually come to conclusions, how you make decisions. It's not a thing where there's like a right way to make a decision as a company. Fundamentally, every company has different values. Every company decides differently, values stuff differently. As at Product Hunt, we ship stuff that's borderline broken. At other companies, you polish and you f make sure everything works because you're dealing with like billions of dollars of whatever, right? Very fundamentally different values and you need to make it explicit of what is your answer to how you make decisions. Um, I would love to just give everything to the team and be like, you guys figure this out. I'm in Bali vacation, have fun. Unfortunately, that's not how, they, how it really works. You need to uh, think about decision-making in layers, and there are layers that you are in charge of. I highly recommend using OKRs as a side note. Delegating trust. In every meeting, it needs to be clear. Like, there's a project. Who will actually lead the decisions? And ideally, to go back, it should be this group of people. Sometimes it's a few other people above who need to help or like whatever, right? Who can override decisions. The important aspect here is, sorry, the important aspect here is if you don't 
make decisions, you only add opinions, period. It needs to be clear up front who makes the decision in the team, ideally the project team. And of course this is complex in real world scenarios. There isn't like a clear hierarchy. There is like a designer who owns design, who wants to do something new. So like, should this person be able to make something new or should it be the project lead? Should it be like one of the engineers who has to implement it and really hates it? Should it be like this other guy who built the old version? Should it be this uh, uh, co-founder and she really w thinks whatever? Here are a part of like the decisions versus opinions. Like here's three tips I would quickly want to share with you at the end of this talk that worked for me. Number one is whenever you're stuck as a team making a decision, instead of arguing if you should do it or not, reframe it as a risk discussion. Risk is usually a resource. And the interesting thing what happens here is that it usually changes the discussion. Like all of a sudden as a team you agree on like days, weeks, people, all this kind of stuff, and you come to an agreement like what should be the outcome of that. Number two, when you're stuck, sometimes you need to ship. This is something that we do aggressively at Product Hunt. Um, very often, when we get to the point that a product, like, yeah, it should be shipped, like, it should be live already, but we're not there yet. And, like, dealing with perfectionists, which I am, you know, like, it should be, but it's not there yet. What we do is we just ship it to 1% of the audience, and the 1% is a placeholder. That can be, like, 100 people, that can be whatever is, like, a small amount of audience in your uh, product that you feel comfortable. Because when you do this, it changes the discussion. It's no longer what do we need to do to make this launch ready. It's what do we need to do to com not completely embarrass ourselves, and what do we need to do to make sure that these people can actually still do roughly what they need to do. Uh, number three is that one thing I struggle with a lot is I tend to give feedback to everything. And as a Germanic person, it's like, hey, here's my feedback. Especially as a manager or as a co-founder, your opinions matters a lot. And if you're like a new product manager in a team and there's like the CEO adding their opinion, hey, I just found this one link about our competitor who is released whatever. Didn't we discuss to also do something like that? What happened there, right? All of a sudden, everybody's like, hey, we should really do that. What Damesh introduced, which I really like, is the concept of flash tags or FYI tags. The main idea is you have a wiki page where you have basically like hashtags like FYI, suggestion, recommendation, and plea, which explicitly tells you what am I expecting you to do now. So to wrap this up here, um, one important aspect with all of that, managing people, managing processes, especially when you scale, is something really, really frustrating. In a lot of moments, you get like frustrated because people don't, know, don't do what you think they should do or stuff doesn't work out, all this kind of stuff. Be aware if you're actually frustrated with them or with the situation. And if it's a situation, fix it. Because ultimately, everything in the company that goes wrong is your fault. I know this is a good slide to end the talk. I know it's like a really whoo, upbeat. But everything in a company is ultimately your fault. You as a manager, you established the process, you created the environment, you created the culture. You hired the people, you didn't fire the people. Every problem that happens is in some way or another your, your fault. So because ultimately what it comes down to is when you manage trust in a team, when you delegate a decision making, when you delegate trust, when you do all these kind of things, it's not so much about the team because the team wants to take more ownership. The team wants to have more responsibility. They want to do that, right? They're cool with that usually. What's usually happening is the problem is with yourself because you're sitting there and you're not sure is this person cur currently coding or not? Are they playing computer games? And you're getting nervous. You're the person like, holy shit, our money runs out. Nobody takes this shit serious and I'm the only one freaking out. Why am the only one freaking out? That's you. That's not, that's not their problem. That's fucking you, right? So when you wonder if people are coding or not, the real question is like, why does it actually matter to you? Why, where didn't you do your job beforehand to figure out processes that you can actually fully trust your team? Where did you didn't f figure out processes? Where didn't you like establish communication understanding so that you know about stuff early on and so on and so on? That you can just like, I don't really care if they play computer games right now because they, I know that they're actually fully productive right now. Thank you. I have more reading here if you want to read this and I'm happy to answer any questions.